that stuff here. Uh, okay. There it goes. That stuff here that will touch the end of the presentation today is sort of the roadmap for quantum computing. There's lots of bricks along the road, holes, but you're riding through it. Okay, so we began quantizing the field. We began uh, in fo uh, following, we described how to express whatever the state the field is. Then we found out how to measure the field. Finally, how to manipulate the field. Now we are going to take those four classes and put things together on the tabletop before the coffee. Afterwards, I will show you the stuff put together on the tabletop, previously assembled, but we are going to play with a small quantum machine. Oh, thank you. Hello? Yeah. Something's following me. So now, let's go for the different machines that can play with light. And maybe the most basic and immediate is related to the use of squeeze state for precise measurements. So the idea of quantum sensing, that was one of the first features that came out in suggestions of use of quantum optics. Remember, coherence was deeply related to the idea of measurement. So here I'm putting, uh, that's not directly linked to quantum optics, but uh, closely related to, because you can use the sensitivity of uh, atoms, of alkali atoms, to magnetic field, to see how they evolve in the presence of another transverse field. So you can use spectroscopy, whose sensitivity can be increased with f if you reduce the noise of the light. And you can make things like measuring the magnetic field generated inside our brains by very tiny currents. You can do it two ways, using sensitive, uh, de uh, sensitive detectors. Squids, for instance, so the people has his head put inside this bulgy machine where you have squids that will be working at, uh, at liquid helium temperature for superconducting. So you cannot move. Uh, you would really have to adjust everything before. So you have this huge machine uh, using liquid helium for superconductivity and measuring, or you can use something that has the size of a uh, okay, uh, controller like this. You can print a helmet on plastic using a printer. And you can put the sensors right here on this helmet. And the patient can be manipulating or realize, realizing different tasks while has the magnetic field close to the scope, being monitored by these sensitive probes. We're talking about a very tiny nanotesla, uh, nanogauss uh, fields. So we're strongly recommending uh, the reading of all the, uh, all the articles around this presentation. But directly from the beginning, cow caves you got the feeling that every time you measure uh, something on continuous variables domain, you find out that Carlton Caves had uh, written that before in the early 80s. So basically, you have the, the return of the Michelson interferometer for the LIGO measurement. Remember that Michelson model interferometer was first used to see the effect of ether uh, on the speed of light and gave a no result. 
very worth to see the both experiments, the first experiment of Michelson and second one with of Michelson and Morley. Uh, first one was done in Berlin, the second one was done in the US. Uh, and all the problems of interferometry that he had solved and characterized that he uh, had not observed any effect of the displacement of Earth under the ether. So the hypothesis could be easily discarded and uh, could support the, the specific uh, special relativity uh, principle. On the other hand, the interferometer can be used to measure a gravitational wave that arrives here and then produces a deformation on the time space. So you can see displacements of the mirrors. So you have here a fabri perot cavity on both sides and both arms of a Michelson interferometer. You enter with the laser light, and here you measure the displacement in a background noise. OK, background noise here, you can have things like seismic noise, uh, suspension thermal noise, from the uh, the mirrors that are hanging from the, uh, from wires, you have noise from the coating of the mirrors. You have noise Brownian noise from the coating. And what's limiting at the end is this guy, quantum noise of your laser. That's the major at that point the major limitation on your sensitivity. So. If you can reduce quantum noise, you can improve this curve and increase the sensitivity. That was the proposal way back by Carlton Caves in the 80s, discussing gravitational waves that were under discussion of the construction of this stuff. And then Roman Schnabel got into the pursuit of making a good squeezer, reliable, trusty, and with high level of squeezing to put on the LIGO. He was working on the JO uh, 600 uh, demonstration facility, and I strongly recommend this article of physics today, saying that I think would be doubly amazed. Doubly amazed because it was using basically the entanglement of those sidebands that I have told you yesterday of the EPR to measure the gravitational waves that comes out from the equations of the general relativity. And what you see here, I borrow an image from the articles of Roman Schnabel. And now, in 2019, uh, people turned on the squeezers. And what you see here is a spectra of the noise in the detection. And when you turn the squeezer, you get 3 dB gain on the signal to noise ratio your noise is reduced by 3 dB. It was tested in Virgo and in LIGO. Now it'll be, you have the two LIGO, Hanford, Stanford, and uh, Hanford and Livingstone, and Virgo. And now there's another one being built in India, and another one, as far as I remember, either in, uh, in China or in Japan. So now with different uh, interferometers, you can really see where is the wave coming from? We will increase the resolution to point where was the merge. So that would be fantastic. The Earth has a huge gravitational wave detectors, detector made by point measurements that they will coincide in events. Well, you heard about the first detection. You heard about the second one. You don't hear about it any longer. I mean, they're piling up. Now becomes a usual result that they're constantly announced. Uh, uh, GWE, gravitational wave event, number, date, and time. And now there's really piling up the events and counting. And the fact that this increasing the uh, this noise reduction, it enables the system to increase the detection of merging of neutron star in about 50% to 25%, basically doubling, doubling the volume of the detection.
in the cosmos. Okay? That's quantum sensing. Next. You can do quantum cryptography. So, talking a, a little bit about cryptography, uh, it's a whole subject, uh, very uh, uh, mathematicians love it. When I go to the mathematical details, often I get lost. Uh, it's for of engineering uh, team involving lots of computation. But let's take an idea. There's a nice book, The Code Book by Simon Singh. that I strongly recommend. For reading, and that describes this, basically, the safest protocol. The one-time pad, so you want to send an information from Alice to Bob, they have a communication channel, but it's prone to the attack of an eavesdropper. Now I present you Alice, Bob, and Eve. The usual players in the whole history. I will spare you from images of Alice in Wonderland, Bob Marley, Bob, uh, SpongeBob SquarePants, Alice Cooper, so on, so forth. Let's call Alice, Bob, and Eve. But the safest way to work with uh, was that one-time pad. And so I was you see many different ways for making cryptography and how they failed how they result in lots of deaths from Mary of Stewart's uh, and uh, falls of uh, political cups and uh, so on and so forth. And uh, how to make a unbreakable code. One way is that the one time pad. So you have a sheet of run, uh, a block of random, uh, here sheet one, sheet two, sheet three random characters, you have a key, that set of random characters, you add attribute numbers to the letters, and then you add A, zero, add to P, got P, T, okay, you count it, so on and so forth, and uh, the original text, attack the valley, add down, plus a random key, results a random, a random set of characters. You cannot extract information just looking at it. If, if it's random, you don't have a spectral analysis that is going to take out information. That's just noise. And how you decode it? You have to use the right key for decoding and repeat the process. If you use a wrong key, you can even get, uh, you can even get uh, Whoops. Same, te uh, same text using a different key can give a different message. So we'll be sending a wrong message of defend the hill at sunset. So the fact that this key is used only once and it's random assures that the message is secure. But that's the point. Only Alice and Bob should have this one time pad and they should use it only once. Afterward, discards. So how to generate random keys, how to distribute, uh, safely distribute the keys. You can send the blocks for two, from two sites, but people could copy that. Somebody could, uh, if a dropper could make a copy of it. How to be sure that only Alice and Bob have the right key, and now comes the quantum S. So we have two protocols, BB84, proposed by Bennett and Brassard, using superposition of single qubits, or the Arthur Eckert protocol using entanglement of pairs of qubits. I'll begin with this one, okay? What's the idea? Eventually, there will be some uh, transparencies that have come out in Portuguese. I may have missed the translation some of them, but the key is quite simple. You can take, and now that's curious, you can take 
the first light source to produce single photons. For instance, that Mandel uh, source of light that we have seen yesterday. And you can prepare this photon in different sets of polarizations, either in the horizontal vertical or in the diagonal basis. You name vertical 1 and horizontal 0, or plus 1 and minus diagonal 0. And then you prepare your bits and send to Bob. And Bob should randomly to measure it either in diagonal or in the horizontal. So you shift randomly here between these, two, uh, these four configurations, and Bob will shift randomly between these two possibilities of measurement. And then you'll be sending photon by photon and building up a table. What comes now? Alice knows the sequence of bits she's sending prepared in different polarization states. Bob knows the bits he measured and knows the basis where he measured it. Now what Bob does is to announce publicly what's the sequence of bases that he has chosen. And Alice answered back when Bob coincided with the basis that Alice prepared the bit. So this bit was prepared and read in the same basis. This not. This yes. Uh, the, uh, sorry, this not. This yes. And so on and so forth. So only these bits will be kept. What Alice is, uh, returns is the no, in which case they took the right basis. They never announce the bits. But they know that the bits that are measured on the same basis, they coincide in both sides. So they retain this as a one time pad. So you still hadn't shared information, but you shared the ability to hide an information using the one time pad. That's the idea behind the quantum cryptography. Why it works? You cannot clone your quantum state. If you try to attack and make a measurement, you measure the state of the bit. You can prepare a state on the outcome, but uh, you're not sure if that was the state that you made the measurement. You don't know if you measured on the right basis. No cloning theorem is quite easy to understand. There's a nice article from Zurich, but in a handy uh, way of describing it, you say that you can have a unitary transformation that take on any state, psi, and you're going to write on a sheet of paper a, co a perfect copy of this state. So this unitary transformation will work on this state psi, but should work on any state psi or phi. So these two operations should be valid. Now, if you take the product here for these two states, when you take the product of these cats with the transposition of this, resulting in a bra here acting on the side, what you have here, the unitary with this transpose, uh, is going to give identity. So you have the projection of psi on phi, and s against s, that's one. And here, this projection squared. In conclusion, what you have is that this side should be equal to its value squared. So you have only two possibilities. Either these two states are the same or they are orthogonal. So it doesn't work universally. You don't have a unitary operation that will work for any, pairs, uh, for any set of states. You can vary this qubit continuously. 
in your uh, Poincaré or Block Sphere. So you are not allowed to make copies. If you would, you would violate the uncertainty principle. OK, it works. Just put on boxes to be sold here by Nicolas Gissin. Or it's curious that ID Quantique claims to be the first uh, source of quantum cryptography. Magic Q claims to be the first <laughs> source of quantum cryptography. Mitsubishi says to be the best, <laughs> claims to be the best, so on and so forth. You can just buy it in a standard, uh, put it in a standard telecom rack and use optical fibers to send as far as you don't make an amplification. You can send losses, okay? You have losses, you miss that qubit, you wait for the next. That reduces the bit rate, but then you keep sending bits until you have a feasible key. It's so reliable that you can put that on a rocket, send it to a satellite, and uh, Anton Zeilinger was trying to make that for quite a while, uh, but at the end of one of his, uh, I believe it was his student, or postdoc, Jian Wei Pan, got back to China and put it uh, on a rocket and got, to, uh, got the Misius satellite that carries three uh, quantum experiments. A random number generator, like the one that you're going to see la uh, later, a BB-84 and an Eckert uh, uh, cryptography generators. So it's a satellite in a heliosynchronous orbit, flying at an altitude of 500 kilometers, a period of 94 minutes. So the consequence is that every night, uh, close to 1 a.m., it passes for five minutes on the side of this station. Nanshan, Grass, and Xinglong. So between May and July of 2017, the heliosynchronous, you have the satellite turning like this. So every day, it passes over the same, uh, the same, uh, the same site at the same hour. And from the satellite, you have the preparation of the state here, one of the, uh, of the four possibilities that come out from these laser diodes. You have a telescope and send it to Earth, you have a beacon that's sort of a pointer in a different wavelength that guides you to point here, and a detector, a camera, that takes the light coming back from uh, another laser coming from Earth here that goes up to the sky and keeps the two uh, telescopes point to each other during five minutes every night. So they made a BB-84 protocol with an increased security, that's the decoy state, to avoid the possibility that you can have two photons being sent and then you can capture one photon. You have this decoy state that can herald if you have an attack. Using eight lasers operating at 800 nanometers, repetition rate of 100 megahertz, and they built basically a sharing of some sort of key of about 100 kilobytes using stations placed by more than by more than 7000 kilometers apart how they made the operation okay you have Alice to Bob but here you see that you have uh, this partner here sending involving two different stations, let's say that these two can share information, you increase the, la the number of bits that they're sharing, but you have basically these two sites and the third party, that is the satellite. What it does is that it makes a BB-84 in this side and this side. So it has two sets of keys, MX and MG. Then the satellite adds up these two, and send the result down. Okay, this grass has this uh, key, 
and satellite as well. Xinlong has the X key and satellite as well. What satellite does is that it combines these two, get a random key that it sends to Xinlong. So you have a random information going down, but you don't know, it never transmits this information of MX. But when you do that, Xinlong can make the sum again, the bytewise, uh, making uh, once again the XOR operation, and what you get here is the GRAS key. So see that you have a step here involving the, uh, the ideas of cryptography. Okay, all the shared information is random, so it's safe, but it's not quantum safe. Let's say that's a NIVO satellite and uh, it's going to keep this information uh, uh, for him. Okay, you have to trust, you have to rely on the satellite to be your satellite. But in principle it works and you have a one-time pad of 10K and then you can use that uh, one-time pad of 10K to share two pictures, you make a combination of uh, a picture with the Mises information, you made the bytewise, and on the other side, in Vienna, you can recover the image of the mathem mathematician Mises, and way back, you can get in, uh, in Beijing, the image of, uh, Shre of Schrodinger. So, you can use it even more. You can get that remain of the key, 70 k, uh, k bytes of, uh, kilobytes of key, to use an information protocol to share a video conference between two sites, Anton Zeilinger and the Minister of uh, Science of China, in a video conference, a video call of one hour, 15 minutes sharing two, giga two gigabytes in data. So, you can use quantum cryptography, odd enough. Let's say that they're using it in a curious way, because they're producing photons either in the age mode or in the V mode. You're basically applying a dagger on horizontal or vertical polarization over the vacuum. So today I'm playing a little bit with the system. It, it works because you're using just a single photon. So when you have a single photon, you can call the mode horizontal or vertical as a property of that photon. So you can twist state and mode by the isomorphism that you have in this relation when you have a qubit. Let's see now how you use cryptography for entanglement, uh, using entanglement. Beginning with the award, uh, Nobel Award uh, uh, system of producing polarized photons with entanglement. So let's say we have a station, can send a photon to Bob, randomly polarize it, Bob makes a measurement and get a result, 50% vertical, 50% horizontal. You can send a randomly prepared photon to Alice, and then you get another pair of possibilities. The sender can make a choice of sending Coincident photons, when you send vertical to Bob, send the horizontal to Alice, and vice versa. He has Alice and Bob make local operations, and you have classical communication decided by the source. So he produces a randomly, randomly this choice of states. Very good, but let's now get this correlation, perfect classical correlation, 
In that case, with discrete variables, you always have perfect classical correlation. So that should have bring, should have brought uh, the socks in different colors for the Bertelmann's sock problem proposed by John Bell. Uh, but I have a fit of a left shoes. Uh, I bought some. I bought a shoe from a company. Open the box, and I see that I have only one left shoes uh, shoe in my box. I know there's one right shoe left on stock of the company. That's perfectly uh, correlated and it's not quantum. The fact that you can now change the basis of your measurements, something that you're not going to pay, uh, pick up a 45 degree shoes <laughs> for, uh, for wearing, will scramble things up. That vertical photon now we read either or uh, diagonal positive or negative diagonal for both sides. And all the correlation, perfect correlation is lost. You get randomly all the four possible combinations. So you lose all that correlation when you change the basis. On the other hand, if you are preparing quantum photons, uh, photons, okay, quantum photons, every photon is quantum, but when you prepare your photons with a quantum source, and you prepare them not in a mixture of A and V, but in a superposition of A and V, you can twist your polarizers and the correlations remain perfect. So that comes from a non-local superposition. You prepare your photons in a state like this, A and V, or V and H, then you can make a change of your basis here. And when you look at what have you have in this change of basis, it has still the same shape, it's still in the same shape of this initial state. More than just the same state, you see that the topology of the state remains the same. That's the example of one of the four Bell states that are proposed by John Bell. Ugh. It misses here the <laughs> okay <laughs> things that only PowerPoint can do for you. The article by John Bell from '64. Just take a look on that proposition to look after the EPR correlations using discrete variables. And that was the proposal that led to the experiments of Clauser. Anton Zeilinger, uh, Klauser, uh, Alain Aspe, and Anton Zeilinger. I will be not showing here Klauser and Alain Aspe. You should take a look on the talk that was given by Jean Dalibar last year at São Carlos Institute, uh, Physics Institute of São Carlos. It's fantastic. He's telling the history of the experiment, of the execution. Uh, the series of uh, Alain Aspe describing the process are really nice. But here I will keep with the effect of uh, that was explored by Nicolas Gisson and Anton Zeilinger, where instead of using atoms, they used crystals. They pump hard the crystal with an UV laser and produce this down conversion process, leading to a pair of cones. Here can be distinguished by colors. Due to the phase matching condition, playing with the refractive index of the, of the fields and uh, with dispersion, with various sort of refractive index, with dispersion and polarization, they could produce these two cones. And here in the intersection, one cone is for a vertical polarization, the other one for horizontal polarization. And here, over this line, you get a photon coming, but you don't know if it's horizontal or vertical. Ignorance is kind. The, your inability to know where, uh, from which cone is coming from can give you the entangled state. Cannot distinguish the origin. So you can, but you know that whenever you have a horizontal, you have vertical on the other side and vice versa. So you can get a state like this, another bell state. And you can use that for communication, that's the idea of the protocol proposed by Arthur Eckert 
and variation of Bennett, Brassard, and Merman in uh, 92. You have this entangled photons that comes here in two sides, and here you can randomly choose the polarization that you make the measurement. When you coincide on the basis, you get coincidence of the detected photons on plus or minus output. So you once again make the same protocol. Randomly choose on each side, and after that, you conciliate your secure key by telling when they have chosen the same basis without telling the result of the experiment. Once again, it works even far away. You can put that on this on the, once again, that's the other experiment on the missile satellite. You can see the publication in 2020 by Jan Wei Pan and Arthur Eckert. So here you have your source, the PPKTP PP crystal, a uh, modified uh, KTP crystal, nonlinear crystal, that will be producing your pair of entangled photons that are sent down to Hearst to two remote stations. They are detected and measured. Once again, beacon lasers to make the telescopes point to each other. And during 11 days, they had five minutes per day of simultaneous sightseeing on both stations. Okay, you can say, you need a clean night, at night, no scatter light around, so this should be quite remote, cannot be, say, in Beijing or Shanghai. <laughs> that would be completely blurred by the city lights. But you can see it far away, and then you can see the light coming from the satellite. And they got a super safe key of 30, uh, 372 bits. In ASCII, that means 47 characters. That looks pretty low. In fact, you have a bit rate of, point of, of a tenth of a bit per second. On the other hand, that's better than an earth link for the same distance. If you had a uh, an optical fiber later, uh, layered from here to here over 1,000 kilometers, the losses of 0.16 dB per kilometer would add up to 180 dB of losses. You cannot amplify that. It works uh, for classical communication because you can put amplifiers and keep pumping up along the way. But you cannot pump up a photon. You cannot clone a photon. When you pump up, you just send a bunch of photons and say, hey, I have a photon. OK, uh, what's the polarization state of the photon? I don't know. I have a photon. That's what the employer says. It loses destroyed information for the case where it's encoded on the polarization of a single photon. Moreover, <laughs> it's encoded in the random polarization of a single photon that's locally a, mix, a mixed state. But yet, you can send this sentence that has exactly 47 characters. So it works. You can put a constellation of satellites and keep sharing perfectly safe keys. All right for the moment. Moving further, quantum interference as a tool for information processing. People mentioned yesterday the Hong U Mandel interferometer. In my opinion, that's one of, uh, I would really say, the most beautiful experiment that I have seen. Because it's so fantastic that you have the generation of a pair of photons that you make them coincide over a beam splitter. So when this mirror, this beam, this beam splitter is displaced, the photons will arrive at different times on the beam splitter. They are not overlapping. When they don't overlap, if you remove this, one photon goes up, other photon goes down, and then you have the coincidence. When you put the beam splitter, half of the time, you have different possibilities. The photons will 
be transmitted, the photons will be reflected in the review of coincidence, or the photons will go one way or the other way, one reflected, then another transmitted, one transmitted, the other reflected. So what you have is a loss of coincidence by one half, but still have coincidences. But when you put the photons to arrive here at exactly the same time, you interfere the possibility that they cross or they reflect. So you make the calculation here. You have this operator describing this mode and now another one for this mode. These are the outputs of your beam splitter. So the input state will be the creation operator for mode one and two acting on vacuum. You can rewrite that in terms of the outputs acting on vacuum. And what you have now is that you're going to have a coincidence in A and 4, or two photons coming out at 4, or two photons coming out on 3. But the possibility that you have reflection for both or transmission for both will add up with an opposition in phase here. As a consequence, when t is equal to r, the coincidence vanishes. So both photons will either come up or come down. It comes because you cannot distinguish the two possibilities of two transmissions or two reflections. Indistinguishability leads to interference. You can say that this is an entangled state, but they're not looking at this state. You're detecting photons on one side and nothing on the other. You're looking after the coincidences. So you're not detecting the state. Your, det uh, your coincidence is sensitive to this state that cancels out when both photons arrive at the same time. So you have your coincidences, and then it drops when you displace this beam splitter. There's in, uh, quantum interference that you have coming from the quantization of the field. There's no classical correspondence here. OK? Questions? That single machine for combining bosons can be used in distinct ways. Let's see first the teleportation. Was the idea behind the teleportation? That's this article. You can see again, Archer Pérez, Wouters, Bennett and Brassard, Claude Crepeau, and Richard Josse. They make a proposal of teleporting any qubit using classical and a nice thing for those who rolls in channel. What's teleportation? Just a first question. Are you familiar with those gates like the C naught, the Hadamar, so on and so forth? Have you seen it along this week? Basically, you begin with a state like this, a random qubit. And then in the system two, you get a superposition. First, you get this state, your qubit, say, zero. You rotate it in a superposition of 0 and 1. You rotate the phase. And then you make a C0 operation entangling the output here. Now you have a bell state involving 2 and 3, uh, the, the lines 2 and 3. Now what you do is a joint measurement of system 1 and system 2. What is this joint measurement? You interfere them with that C0 operation and the Hadamard operation. So the idea here is that your global state will be reading like this. The product is a product state of your input and the entangled state that you can rewrite that, putting in evidence only the state three the state in, in rail three. And here you have different combinations but what you see here is that 
we find the four possible Bell states. So whenever you make your detection here, transposing it into the clicks on these two detectors, you can herald to the other line which Bell state you have measured. As a consequence, you know that the rail on system 3 will be some translation of your input state with different flips here on the other side. You can just take the reading and upon heralding, so you have the clicks here telling you which combination of clicks you have. With that, you can make unitary transformation. So if you're herald this Bell state measurement here, you know that your state here corresponds to your input state. Or if you got this state, you know you need to make a sigma z operation. Or if you have this state, you know you must make a sigma x operation to get the qubit. Or in this case, a sigma y operation. So you have here all the Pauli matrices and identity to transform the state into the final state that should be equal to the initial state. Notice, in any time, you send the state through your line. Notice, again, when you make the measurement here, you don't get any information of this state. It's erased by the fact that you made a joint measurement by this with this state that locally is just a mixture of 0 and 1. But it's a perfectly correlated mixture with the mixture of the other side. And the fact that you have this perfect correlation upon measurement allows you to manipulate the state on the other side and make the teleportation. It's not magic, it's not superluminal, because you need to make the measurement and herald the results to the other side. You need this classical link in order to perform the operation and produce the state at the end. How do you know it worked? OK, you can prepare a state, send here, and then make the tomography of the state coming out on the other side. How you make the tomography? You send the same state again and again and again and again, and make a complete reconstruction by making distinct measurements on the other side. Now you change your state here. Take another state and repeat, another state and repeat. And you check for the fidelity of your teleportation protocol. How to put that on the tabletop? That was the work of Zeilinger, Baumeister, John Weipan. And they basically have the initial state. Alice make the right measurements with the entangled pair. One of the, whenever it has a click on a given state, they tell Bob, say, hey, you got the teleported state. So they don't make an active operation. They just herald that they have the state. So it works only one quarter of the time. But it's called conditional, uh, conditional teleportation. How they do that? They send light through the crystal, producing a pair of lasers, a, a pair of photons, and send the light back, producing another pair of photons. The first photon here say, OK, we got one photon on this side. It comes here, and then using the beam splitter, they can make the joint measurement of this photon 2, that's entangled to photon 3, and the initial state prepared on this side. Whenever they have the double click, they tell Bob to make the measurement and check out the protocol by making the tomography of, of the state. See that you don't have any action on the other side. should be able to manipulate that, but with that you need delay lines and operations. So that's a tricky part, a technical tricky part. But for, uh, for them to check that they have successful teleportation, they make here teleportation with a 45 degree polarization state. And they look after the coincidence in a sort of Hongu model interference. Pretty nice but works only one quarter of the time. 
can we do better? And the answer is yes. We can make that with continuous variables. Let's say that you want to make teleportation like a billiard ball. There's a billiard ball that arrives on the pool A. You measure position and momentum, and you tell to the other table to make a kick on the other ball, the red ball, giving it the exact amount of position and momentum, the exact amount of momentum at a given position, and reproduce the state of the first ball. OK, classically, feasible. Quantically, no. You have an uncertainty of this arriving ball. When you make the measurement, you add uncertainty. You need to make a compromise of both x and p. And now, when you send this information with this added noise, you're going to give this kick with added noise over this noisy ball. And what you get in the output will be three times the variance of the input uh, of the input billiard ball. So you have a noisy ball that enters, you add noise on, my, on measurement, and by applying that on a noisy ball, you add another unity of noise. But you can play differently with entanglement. So you have it here, two fuzzy detection systems, but they are perfectly correlated. OK, uh, to be perfect, this would occupy here the whole wall. They are entangled. So fluctuations in B are anti in position in B are anti-correlated with fluctuations in A. Momentum in B is correlated with momentum in A. So when you make the measurement here, your information about the first ball is degraded. And once again, ignorance is kind. If you lose your information, you lose your ability to make copies. You cannot copy that state. You have excess noise here. That's fantastic, because this excess noise can be sent in form of information to the other side. And then you're making the operation over the other state. And when you do that, you will cancel out this excess noise that's correlated here. And what you have at the end is exactly the fluctuations that you had at the input. It only works because you lose the ability of making copy here. The worse the copy that you could make, the better your teleportation protocol will work. So that's a proposal by Jeff Kimball, in a work involving Posik and Furusawa. Uh, Brownstein as well, we're going to see his name along the presentation yet. So they get the input state. Here, they send two squeezed state of this a pair of OPOs, producing a squeezed state, interfering in a beam splitter, producing entanglement. They jointly overlap the state with the entangled chair, sent to the two stations, and here they, max, um, they measure x and p quadratures, or x and y, just choose your name. But they make a simultaneous measurement of two quadratures of the field. You know, uh, you're not allowed to make a perfect measurement of two quadratures of two conjugate quadratures. And that's the point. For you to make the measurement of these two quadratures, you need to add noise. If you don't have this input, you're just adding vacuum here and degrading the measurement. You're sending to the other side and modulating a laser beam, a coherent state, and making the detection. So you have one unit of vacuum added here, your coherent state that's modulated, with this excess noise of vacuum that entered here. So here you have something that has three times the variance of the vacuum. But whenever you have entanglement, you beat that limit. You don't pay those quantum penalties in terms of vacuum fluctuations. 
So when you do that, you have the cancellation of the noise. And when you make the measurement of the fidelity, you make the reconstruction of this state compare with your input state, if the fidelity is greater than one half, you have success. If it's better than two thirds, that means that Alice could not make a better copy than the, co the copy that Victor has. So it's suitable for cryptography, a safe cryptography system. So you can send the message here in one side and recover it on the remote. Now we'll be sending the message itself, not a key. Finally, that, how does it translate in the oscilloscope? So you can see here that you have this interference pattern. So that's the measurement of the state produced by Alice. And whatever you have on Victor's side, you can compare the state, make this tomography of the state on the other side, and see that whenever you make your measurement without entanglement, you get a line up here. And when you turn on the entangled system, it goes down like this. So this 4.7 dB corresponds to the two added units of vacuum in the teleportation. When you turn on the entangled uh, state, you gain here a, a little bit more than 1 dB in your signal to noise ratio. Here's the shot noise in Victor measurement. So by looking at this line, you can tell, OK, I've got teleportation. Does it tell you when you change the gain, you can have a peak on fidelity? And you compare here the classical and the quantum, the use of classic, only quant classical resource, and here when you trust on quantum resource. You can use that even to make the teleportation of non Gaussian states, as was demonstrated by the group of Rusawa. Now, uh, it was, uh, later it was at the University of Tokyo. So basically it has this entangler. And here it produces a squeezed state and then subtract a photon. That's really nice. When you take a squeezed state and subtract a photon, you produce something that's called a Schrodinger kitten. It's a small cat. You see that the amplitude here is lower than one for our number of photons added on this state. It's mostly vacuum, but then you have a pair of photons. So it's something that's close, a sort of deformed, uh, uh, deformed single photon state on this side. Now when it makes the teleportation, you see that the negativity here it is still present. It only happens when you have that two-third condition. You can improve uh, increasing entanglement, increasing your detection efficiency to get better and better resolution here and get more and more negativity of your Wigner function. All right, questions here? With the uh, okay. Hello. Hello. Okay. Uh, can you do quantum k distribution with continuous variables? Uh, yes. This you can. There are protocols that use it either. Uh, weak coherent states mm -hmm. that produce uh, basically an alphabet can basically end a coherent state that's pretty small in one side or the other. And then you measure the fluctuations. Mm -hmm. So here you got your vacuum state. Then you can make a displacement. 
either its place to this side or to this side. Okay? Mm -hmm. So we can claim that this one is zero and this one is one. And then you can establish a threshold here. Say that whenever you have a cut here, you be consider considering it zero, and whenever you have a cut here, you'll be considering it one. Mm -hmm. If you make a measurement, you'll be affecting the state, you'll be adding noise, and then you'll be degrading the communication. Ah, okay. And that is the way the, the parts can notice if someone is, uh, if is dropping, right? Exactly. I mean, there's on those continuous variable states, it's not something that you can always uh, tell that, okay, that's secure by polarization, and it's very hard for you to say that, okay, there's some attacks that are absurd, like blinding the detector, sending a strong pulse that you reduce the efficiency, and uh, then you damage the detectors for making a nip dropping for the, uh, for the discrete variables regime. I mean, the sort of, uh, okay, you can see when your detector is not working. Yeah. <laughs> if you poke a hole on the surface of the detector, I don't see that uh, as uh, eavesdropping. That's really kicking hard. <laughs> but in this case, it's suitable to eavesdropping, so you need some of cryptography techniques to give the shielding. Okay. To ensure, and that's giving the shielding, that means that Bob gains more information than Eve. So Eve can get some information, but if Bob has more information, he can combine with Alice to make operations and make the sifting of the key. They pure the key until he be sure that Eve has no possibility of having information, and only Bob has information. But then you're discarding hardly a good part of your possible bits. Other questions? Mm. Uh, I had a problem here with. Tem um problema com zoom aqui que deu uma mensagem bizarra de um erro desconhecido, tá? Eu só tô. Não sei, só vou estar seguindo em frente. No comment. Ok, we had a zoom problem, but. PowerPoint is working. Now let's make quantum computing. That's the tricky part, and I'll begin by an evidence of quantum supremacy using photons. So you see that Hong Wu Man interferometer, once again, Zhang Wei Pan, and his small team. I believe they can may call it uh, this uh, full soccer team, including, uh, including the reserves. He made boson sampling. Do you know that gout on board, where basically drop something here, and then you have a set of pins set, and the particle will be kicking around, leaning at the end to a Gaussian distribution at the bottom? You can have seen that in a science demonstration. I need to buy one of these for my desk. But they made something that involves the interferometry using 100 modes. And now, the sort of problem that quantum got on board is something that's unsolvable classically. You cannot simulate the quantum got on board with, bo with bosons in a classical way. So the first experiment was just producing those pairs of photons here on BBO crystal. And remember, what you have here on this pump, you're producing under your unitary operation, your squeezing operation in vacuum can be described as uh, a two-mode squeezing operator 
we will probably be producing either 0, 0 plus 1, 1 plus 2, 2 plus 3, 3, so on, so forth. Okay? You have a paired number of photons on mode A and B. That's the, uh, the squeezing operation. When the squeezing is small, you have, um, I put this as A naught, you have A much bigger than B, much bigger than C, so you can discard all the terms of series. And this guy will be also necessarily much smaller than A naught. But the point is, when you have vacuum, you don't detect it. So you just work or just count whenever you have a click. So you discard the vacuum. So in practice, you're producing only pairs of photons. That's what you had way back on that experiment by Anton Zeilinger for the, uh, the Anton Zeilinger experiment or in Clauser and uh, Aspe experiments producing pairs of photons that are entangled. Fine? That said, they have three producing productions of states like this, and they make it interfere here along the path and counts the events in the output. How many photons they have, or count whenever they have photons coming out here, and when they have not. So when they make the input modes and count the distinct outputs, they get a certain distribution, and that's something yet that can simulate classically and make the counts of the possible combinations and their probabilities. That was the first demonstration using something that has six input ports, two polarizations, so 12 inputs, 12 outputs. Half of time, now uh, those six input ports and, uh, and the 12 input ports, six you have state and six you have vacuum. It works, so now they piled up. So that's the tabletop. Here you have, uh, here you have all the input fields coming in a box, a glass box uh, here with that stacked uh, structure. So we have 25 inputs in one direction, 25 on the other, we're entering vacuum. And for each of these inputs, you have two possible polarizations. So you have 100 inputs, and therefore 100 outputs that you send to the detectors here. Uh, those are optical fibers. Those are the squeezers that are coming to the table, make phase locking, and then you can send to the, no, those uh, fires are going to the, uh, to the detectors, sorry. Those are going to the detectors, and then you have the input coming from optical fibers. Okay? Nice draw line, isn't it? That's the view of the, of the system. So we have here 25 squeezers. Uh, they work with two polarization, so you double it. 50 single mode squeezing states entering here in the box. All the circuits, you have all those phase lockets for, interf uh, uh, for the interference. So that's the input, and that's the boson sampling that they have. And afterwards, they have all those detections, sending it to 100 single photon detectors. And now they got something. OK, that's the heart of the interference process that you have going on with all the overlapping and the interference going on here. 
Now they can run the experiment, make the theory, for only two clicks on the output. And when they ramp up to 23 outputs, that's something that they, they cannot simulate on theory. And they can only execute it on the tabletop. That's the idea of quantum, uh, of quantum advantage. You make some process, quantically, that cannot simulate with classical resources. Uh, the microphone or? Okay. So how they, do they obtain the fidelity if they do not know the output state by classical <laughs> computation? Honestly, that's a good question. <laughs> I don't know the, the details on the process. I cannot tell you on spot. Uh, a sort of part that's in the supplementary material of 40 pages of this article. But uh, they have a uh, basically established a fidelity criterion that can extract from the countings on the output. And you can begin by that making, so most of times you have uh, for those problems like these or the problems that are solved both by Sycamore and, okay, once again, John Wei Pan made uh, a Chinese version of the uh, of the Google uh, uh, of the Google, Google superconducting uh, quantum uh, processor. So we have a process that you can check out by a statistic of the measurement, the success of the process. So you have basically you have a benchmark where you can test. You can. Begin with a state where you can easily calculate. Use that to check that your benchmark works. So you can compare theory and experiment. And then you can send a state that you cannot compare with theory and see if that measurement of, of uh, if your benchmark gets the same result with this other state that's non computable. For the quantum process, both states are pre-equivalent. You don't have any intrinsic difference between the comfortable and non-comfortable states that you enter on the system. So often you can get some from statistics or the distribution, some sort of benchmark. There on Sycamore was something like uh, entropy or fidelity entropy, some, uh, some other quantity that could be extracted from the final states of, uh, of the qubits. And here there's another benchmark they call fidelity. And, uh, and this variation distance that they can say that, OK, we got uh, this uh, boson sampling occurring. In this case, you cannot make the classical computation. Other questions? Way back. Uh, um, I just wanted to to ask uh, to ask if the reason for the for they not not being able to simulate uh, classically is more uh, because of the scaling problem of the system or more fundamental reason. It's for it's just the scaling problem. Yes. Quantum problems, you scale exponentially. Yes. So if you add another photon in the problem, it ramps up fa uh, very rapidly. OK, so this is the reason. So they just to uh, so say, with two photons, OK, you can, uh, if you get two photons at the input, it's quite immediate for making the calculation. Yes. A third photon will require much more computational power. Fourth photon will go in scaling badly until a point that okay, not a, uh, you add one photon and supercomputer, and no, not the best computer on Earth can work it out. Okay, okay, thank you. The drawback on these uh, those experiments of quantum advantage that's a demonstration that you can make machines that execute a problem better than you can. Simulate that quantically. Uh, sorry, better can simulate them classically. But it's not a universal computer machine. 
it executes one problem, that boson sampling. What's good that for? I don't know. Uh, just a Gaussian board that works on quantum regime. It is not something that can use for making uh, any climate uh, simulation, simulate molecules, simulate uh, structures on a solid state or whatsoever. But to demonstrate that there are problems that can that a uh, classical computer won't do and you can do in a machine. Now comes the outlier, the competitor, with those discrete photons, and we get back at the end of the talk to the continuous variable re regime. So, all that instead of clicks, you can work in a different way that was proposed for a, a one way quantum computer where you use can produce a network of entangled states and then basically here you have them in a superposition of uh, sigma z eigenstates entangled side by side and then upon measurement when you measure this qubit you affect or you are, you are able to affect the following one and so on and so forth, much like the teleportation protocol that I have presented you for discrete variables. And in this case, while you go making measurement and processing, measuring and processing, measuring and processing, you can decouple some of the qubits and make operations in a chain here. So you begin using these qubits, you decouple these from the network, make a measurement, go to the next, measure next, measurement next. The fact is that you don't need to have all these entangled uh, states simultaneously. You can be producing this, you're shewing up this line, and go through this ribbon of states while you're producing. You can have an output giving you a series of entangled states, and you can get information processing along the way. So you get rid of a, one of the problems, that is degradation of the state. If it lasts long enough for you to make the processing, you can be running on the top of this flow of qubits. Another question way up. Uh, let's take the microphone and make the passage uh, to come on, to back, and so on. So uh, hello, Professor. I have a question about uh, this one-way quantum computer. And if uh, this system can be like uh, taught like a, a quantum, um, the, the classical, like the... In classical computation, we have like this one way, and we basically have like one bit reading, and like Alan Turing machine. And this, uh, if the Turing machine that you you need to 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 make all this uh, the sequence of reading to get like the final one. And uh, my question is about here about the interference between this one. If he, he, about this one-way computation, if can be interpreted like Alan Turing quantum computation. Um, that was that was question. Uh, if can be interpreted as unitary, I don't think so, because your work with measurements along the way. Also, when you think of quantum computation, you have uh, the whole processing, and then at the end you make the measurement. And the measurement is a non-unitary operation. Yeah, but th there is interference in between the, the process in the quantum computing. In quantum computing, as far as you don't have uh, the decoherence effect, you can go the way and you can go back. It's unitary as far as you don't have measurement from the environment or from the, uh, uh, from the person that's processing the information. There is like this time re reversibility. This D? Time re you can make the unitary operation. Tangler, sorry, uh, 
Like the when you go back in the time. Okay. And like do the reverse engineering about your state. As far as you are working with unitary process, it's okay. Okay. But that's not the case. Because you have measurements along the way. So mm. you cannot reverse it to the, uh, to the back due to the fact that you have consumed your substrate. But eventually, you can begin to make the reverse operations along the path. And maybe uh, in that case, uh, I believe that it will, will work as a reverse process. You begin, you keep shearing up your entanglement along the way, but then you keep shearing up and then you will get back to your initial state if you stop here and begin to make the reverse. Okay, thank you. Okay, there's a question uh, here. So this is you are doing with, uh, with continuous variables, right? Um, or not? Here is with qubits. Okay, but you can do this with continuous vari variable. Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, and then this is what you call the cluster state in the continuous variables, where instead of looking at eigenstates of Pauli matrices, mm -hmm. you're looking at eigenstates of position and momentum operators. So you change again. Remember that uh, similarity between qubits and covariance matrix that I was discussing uh, back on uh, the Paris uh, entanglement criterion. Here, you can play it a little bit around and uh, see also that similarity of producing a mesh of entangled states in the continuous variable regime and using that for computation. Okay, uh, I have other question is, is that one way computing that you are using? Is that a way to overcome the coherence from the environment? And that's the point. Uh, if you can process the information quickly, quickly, uh, it's okay. You'll be producing entangled states, and you're using that entangled states for processing along the way. I don't know if the, it's the, if it's time to ask this question. Maybe you can ask uh, uh, answer me later. But this, uh, I always want to know how quantum computation deals with the coherence. So this is the way because I always ah. ask it: how you how can we make uh, two two things? A uh, human machine interface. How can we deal with this without destroying states? And two. How can can systems survive with the coherence? Uh, I wouldn't say that's the million dollar question because that would be the trillion dollar question. <laughs> 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 How to deal with that is the great question because uh, if you take uh, computers like uh, it also, uh, I mean, the coherence also scales badly, mm -hmm. it scales exponentially mm -hmm. uh, with the number of bits that you have. Sure. So the biggest is the your is your quantum machine, the faster it will decay. That's the idea of the cat. It's macroscopic, uh, it won't live in a superposition. Or if you if, okay, let's play with uh, the, the coherence of those cat states that mm -hmm. you have in a cavity, the biggest is the cat, mm -hmm. the fastest uh, the fastest the it will uh, end up in one or the other state. Yeah. So there are either correction protocols or the ideas of using those machines that will be producing uh, entanglement and then show you up. Mm -hmm. So that's what brings us to that. Uh, uh, it's very good that you wrote, because that reminds of the announcement that Roman made at the beginning of the noise intermediate quantum computing. There's the roadmap where we expect that before reaching a really a real quantum computer, multitask that can use to do whatever you want, mm -hmm. you'll be dealing uh, where we're going to use error, uh, fault tolerant operations. And okay, uh, it's a nice book on the Feynman Lectures on Quantum Computation. You should read that, even for the classical. It's amazing the ways that you have to protect information from degradation in classical 
processing. Memories are prone to fault. And when you have one gigabyte of bits, a bit flip can be damaging, dramatically damaging, to your information processing. That will make your program stop working. So you need correction systems there, and you can do that classically for classical bits. So you have fault tolerant processing in classical systems. Texas as quantum systems are more prone to fault due to the coherence. And you cannot make measurements and store it back. You are not allowed to measure, and that's the, the main drawback. So uh, you need to develop uh, fault-tolerant protocols that will extend, the, let's say, the life of the kitten. But before reaching there, there are those uh, possibilities of making the noise intermediate, uh, uh, noise intermediate scale quantum computation. Mm -hmm. They can work with some amount of noise. You can have tasks that, are, that, uh, that can live or can deal with some amount of noise. So that's more or less where we are now, trying to find tasks that will work with some, uh, some faults along the way. And they, the, the, the important part, they should be useful. Thank you. Okay. So that's just a claim that you can make this producing those cluster states and here for us all again, using squeezers and beam splitters like these. You have these four PO producing squeezer states, and playing with phase balancing of these beam splitters, you can produce different cluster states. Or you can bring them out rightly from the heart of an LPO, and that's where Olivier Fister works, playing with different modes of an LPO, and producing here different meshes of four mode integral states. So it has 60 cavity Q modes or quantum modes of these four mode integral states. Or that's the setup. I mean, it looks complicated, but in fact, everything is all the magic is happening here. All the rest here is detection of all the different combinations that can look at the end and see the squeezing as the heralding of entanglement. So everything is happening here, producing this quantum comb. The rest here is just the detection, and here producing the local oscillators for each one of those modes. The quantum machine is here. The rest is technical, nicely technical. But that's uh, the size of your detector. But it's technical. It's, you can deal with losses here. What you are not dealing with losses is here, but it's just one of you. So losses will be small. Losses are small. And you can make more. You can make a rail of entangled states. Once again, Olivier Fister playing with the modes. Another configuration of OPO producing a whole set of rails where you can see entanglement between these pairs, these pairs, and see that these and these pairs are not entangled, so on and so forth. And that can be a substrate for quantum information processing. So the question now is, where do we go? We have seen some quantum machines using optics. There are some that are really working now. LIGO and Virgo are working with squeeze states. Squeeze states can be used for uh, sensitive measurements. Qubits can be used for quantum cryptography. Can, do also quant uh, can also do quantum cryptography using continuous variables. And now we're trying to make that uh, one of the possible substrates for quantum computation. OK, there are competitors. There are atoms. There are ions. There are uh, squids. There are the superconducting uh, transmons. Uh, so Q dots coming along. So who will be the winner? Nobody knows. When somebody say, claims that he's sure that this will be the winner, either 
is selling a product, uh, talks of his own company, or making a risky bet. Maybe it can be something hybrid, hybrid uh, outcome, combining the best of each one of those parts. So I don't know where do we go, but the idea is that we will be there uh, playing with it. The sort of old transparency of the group, uh, me and Paul are the leaders of the group, and we have the, our postdocs. It's quite old. Roger, Alvaro, and Raul, they got their PhD last year. And I just this morning I have shifted uh, Yuri uh, and Gabriel, their uh, undergrad, and now they're graduate students. Oops, Theo is there. No, uh, yeah, the appointment there at the institute. Uh, tell him I'm sorry, his doctorate. Uh, tell his doctorate. <laughs> so there's a shift on the positions, and worse, uh, worse than that, we have four undergrads that are not listed here. <laughs> <laughs> the good part is that uh, we got ups, we got more funding from FAPESP, we got our thematic project approved money for more four years, integrating the INCT with our friends in the state of Sao Paulo and the friends in, uh, around the world, like Olivier Fister, uh, Alberto Marino, folks from the Laboratoire Castel Bocel, uh, possibility with Avipir, so connections around the world. So that's it. Thank you very much. No questions or coffee? <laughs> no questions? Uh, one there. <laughs> yes, so um, about this idea of um, doing quantum computation with um, continuous variables. So in the end, um, how, how, in practice, how, how, do you, how does this work? Do you have a complete adaptation of the algorithms for continuous variables, or at some point you take your in the beginning you take your continuous variable and you divide in a bunch of qubits and you use them like a that's the main point. If you play with continuous Gaussian continuous variables, uh, continuous or continuous variables in the Gaussian domain, as I have shown here, what you get at the end is something that can simulate just with noise entering your system. They're just using vacuum, but could see a, could be a thermal noise. There's some nice works that were done by Avipir, for instance, demonstrating some features of OPOs, but uh, OPOs built with, uh, with electronics. OK, they're, sorry, they're not O any longer. They're parametric oscillators using microwave electronics. So you can demonstrate some features of, op of, op of optical parametric oscillators using electronics and some synchronization and some uh, multi-states that they can jump from one to another, uh, some simulations of uh, Ising chains using just thermal noise in um, uh, microwave parametric oscillators. In that case, you can uh, just claim, OK, uh, what's the difference in this case? You're just using vacuum as your noise. So your noise is quantum. So what? What are you gaining? They can become universal information processors as far as you have a non-Gaussian operation. So there are some possibilities. One of them is making photon number resolving detection at the end. So some of those detectors that you have seen on Gaussian boson sampling, they're counting events. The events are having an outcome in a, in a port. But they're not counting photons. You can get better or get better uh, processing capacity if you begin to count how many photons you have at the end of your, uh, of your process. And now, with this non-Gaussianity, you can have, you can implement quantum gates. 
Another possibility that's under discussion is those uh, QKP states. Uh, no, GKP. Uh, Gottsman, Kitayev, Preskill states that they are intrinsically non Gaussian states. There are something like a set of possibilities here in the say here we are in P description. So you have a set of odd P states or even P states. So if you get this parity and these two possibilities coming out, now you can take a distinction and uh, OK, say it's non-Gaussian, and can make some information processing on top of that for a for, uh, GKP. Even or GKP. But whenever you discriminate between one and the other, that can work combined with the photon the resolving detection. But once again, that is still on its uh, first demonstrations that first you can generate that, you can generate that with fidelity, and the discussion that goes into a lot of theory, but they can stand losses as far as you begin with a squeezing. You, all the, everything starts with squeeze the state, but you begin with 20 dBs of squeezing. That's tough, but doable. The record, uh, something like 18 or 15 dBs by Roman Schnabel. Uh, you don't need that much. For uh, for the gravitational wave detector, but it was a demonstration that uh, Roman Schnabel had all the expertise for going further on this uh, squeezing uh, state uh, preparation. So a sort of technically feasible limit. So, but there's still a long way for putting in the competition with all the others, uh, different setups for quantum information processing. Others? If not coffee and experiment, I would suggest 